From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's New York and Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. Six jurors selected today in Donald Trump's New York criminal trial with the judge warning Trump not to intimidate them. We'll have more on that case in a separate January 6th case heard at the Supreme Court today with former White House special counsel Ty Cobb. Speaker Mike Johnson says he is not resigning as his plan for separate votes on Israel and Ukraine aid this week spurs a new ouster threat from a second member of his Republican conference. We'll get the view of another Republican Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. We'll also ask him about a plan to use seized Russian assets to fund Ukraine's war effort, an idea U.K. Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt calls intriguing. We'll have more on what Hunt said on geopolitics coming up this hour, plus a conversation with former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq and Turkey, James Jeffrey. Kaylee, day two for you in New York and day two for Donald Trump in the courthouse while the world awaits news from Washington here. We got a path on funding for our allies, Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Kaylee, the speaker, wants to cut them all up in a Frankenstein sort of strategy, have them all voted on separately, yeah. and then try to reassemble the body and bring it back to life in the Senate. We'll see how he does. It's a tall order, certainly, and it's worth pointing out that while that is our understanding of Johnson's plan, we still have not yet seen the text. They were going to try to release it by tonight to allow for a vote on Friday. I guess we'll all see if that happens and what may happen as a consequence, considering now it is not just Marjorie Taylor Greene, but also Republican Congressman Tom Massey, who are suggesting they would move to oust the speaker if he puts Ukraine aid on the floor. Mike Johnson says, I'm not resigning even in the face of that threat. Here he is. I am not resigning, and it is um, it is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. We're joined now in Washington by Bloomberg senior Washington editor Wendy Benjaminson. And it's moment by moment here, Wendy. It does look like it's going to be a late night. There's no piece of legislation. Will they actually get this done tonight? Because the clock will be ticking uh, on a potential 72-hour rule. They have to have time to read all of this. And there's a little thing called a recess coming in a couple of days. Exactly. Another recess for Congress. We don't know if it's going to come together tonight. They've got to write four separate bills. And these things are hard. I mean, they're detailed documents. Um, and they, they've got to get that done. They've got to um, write four of them. They may have the 72-hour rule. I saw just before we came in here that they may, they're may they talking about waiving that 72-hour rule, which the opposition party always complains vociferously about because they want to read what's in it and make sure no sure. one's screwing it up. And, um, you know, and then it has to go to the Senate, and then the Senate has to vote on it. And they're not crazy about working this weekend, but they will if they have to. So it's who knows what's happening right now. Well, and Wendy, who knows what will happen even if we actually do get a vote on Friday. It's a question of what comes after that, considering now there really could be a motion to vacate supported by not just one, but two members of the Republican conference. And after Friday, we'll be down to a one vote margin because Congressman Mike Gallagher is retiring at the end of this week. So it's going to require Democrats to save the speaker, potentially. What do Democrats need to see before they would ever consider casting a vote or just not showing up to a vote in order to protect Johnson? Well, that's exactly why, Kaylee, Democrats want to see these bills, because they want to see what's in it. They want to see if it's something they can live with. They don't want to go through the chaos of another speaker battle. And several, including Henry Cuellar from Texas and some others, have said they will, prob they will probably vote to help Johnson keep his job, uh, you know, if he wants to, if, or if he, if he is faced with this motion to vacate. But you're absolutely right. When Mike Gallagher leaves next week... They need Democrats to help them. And the last time, as we remember, when Kevin McCarthy faced this fate, 
uh, that the um, Democrats, you know, helped him helped open the door for him to leave. This time, I think patients may be wearing thin. They know that um, those who support Israel want that Israel aid passed quickly. Those who support Ukraine, including a lot of moderate and old school Republicans, want that aid to Ukraine. And, um, you know, they, time is running out, as you say. Indeed. Wendy Benjaminson, thank you so much. Of course, elsewhere in congressional news today, it is worth pointing out the articles of impeachment against the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas were brought to the Senate today. We'll see how that is acted on tomorrow. It is very likely that that effort will die in that chamber. Now turning to the campaign trail and the split screen images of Donald Trump here in Manhattan in a courtroom and President Biden campaigning in the swing state of Pennsylvania. We heard from former President Trump railing against the court earlier in New York this morning. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Gregory Cordy, who covers national politics for us. So we're still looking at the second day of proceedings ongoing, Gregory, but we have seen yesterday and certainly this morning that Trump is once again using these courtroom appearances to his advantage in an attempt to address the press and plead his case. Is this a pattern that is going to keep working for him as he is in trial as a criminal defendant or does something change now in this moment? Well, we certainly know that every time he appears on courthouse steps, he's indicted, he faces some other legal controversy. It's been a fundraising bonanza for him. But these small dollar donors that have been really propping up the Trump campaign are starting to get a little fatigued of writing $50, $100 checks every time Trump gets into legal trouble because, frankly, Trump's been in a lot of legal trouble. And so we'll see if, if Trump can continue to capitalize on this. The other thing that's different from some of these past events is that now we are in a general election phase. It's no longer Trump getting a bump from Republicans in the Republican primary from these, uh, these cases, but now he's in a general election where independent voters might be turned off on the prospect of seeing uh, one of the leading candidates for president uh, in a courthouse every day. You wonder if life is getting more uh, complicated for both candidates here. Donald Trump stuck in a courthouse four days a week. Joe Biden is ensconced in a very controversial world that includes uh, geopolitical strife in a couple of hot wars underway here, not to mention explaining away his efforts to combat inflation. I haven't even mentioned the border yet, uh, Gregory. This isn't getting easier for either of them, is it? No, it, it, certainly uh, when you are the incumbent president, you own all of those issues. You own everything that's going on in the world. You own the economy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, the Biden needs to be able to get out and hit these swing states and make the case for why the economy is not doing as well as people think it is. That's been a tough case for him to make. Uh, the, e even though the, uh, the economic data is pretty good, we had a, a little bit of a blip on the inflation read uh, yeah. recently. We now have the Fed uh, signaling that they are not lowering interest rates anytime soon. Mm -hmm. That's got to hurt people when thinking like the, 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 the light at the, the end of the tunnel is not as close as we thought it was maybe on the economy. People's memories are short, too. When they think back where they were four years ago, it's fascinating. This new Siena New York Times poll found a big increase, nine points in registered voters who believe Donald Trump left the country better off. We'll see what the next couple of months does with that narrative. Gregory Cordy, we thank you for the insights. Coming up, we'll dive into what we learned from day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's criminal trial in Manhattan. Former White House Special Counsel Ty Cobb is with us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington, joined by Kaylee Lyons today from New York, where it is day two of jury selection in the criminal case against Donald Trump on charges, of course, related to alleged hush money payments. Six jurors were selected, six more jurors and six alternates are still to go. For more on the early stages of this trial, we're joined now by former White House special counsel, Ty Cobb. It's great to have you back, Ty. The process of jury selection, as we know, uh, has been a grind. We saw it coming. We might argue that it's been even more difficult than some suggested. To what extent will it extend this trial? And I just wonder your thoughts on Donald Trump attempting to stare down uh, some of these potential jurors 
uh, giving them uh, smiles, in some cases scowls and other, depending on what social media site they were subscribed to, what they thought of Donald Trump, the politician. When is this going to be over so we can get to the real stuff? So, Joe, I think jury selection is going at the pace that I would have predicted. I mean, they've, they have at least six jurors and a foreman today. Um, that's, you know, after one day. You know, people were suggesting this jury selection could take up to six weeks. Uh, that's yes, that's right. rarely, been, rarely been my experience. I think they'll have a jury uh, Friday, if not Friday, on Monday. Uh, so I think they'll be ready to start the trial pretty quickly. Well, and then, of course, once the jury is seated, that is when the real trial, if you will, gets underway and that it will be arguments being made, witnesses uh, testifying and the case for the defense to make their case alongside the prosecution. And Ty, I feel like we got maybe somewhat of a preview of what Trump's defense is likely to look like when he spoke on his way into court earlier today, talking about how the payments he made to Michael Cohen that are in question here, he really thinks were legal expenses, not something that he misclassified that should have been related to his campaign. What do you think about that as a defense and whether or not it is likely uh, to work when he is either convicted or acquitted at the end of this trial? Okay, well, I think that's, that's an excellent question. I think the, the problem he has with that argument is the math doesn't support it. Uh, you know, the payment was $130,000. Cohen got paid $412,000, as I recall, uh, as they doubled it up for uh, taxes and gave him a, uh, an additional bonus. So uh, the number of falsified uh, invoices uh, is is substantial, and the number that reflected in the total is significantly higher than uh, the $130,000 payment. So I think actually that uh, argument plays into the heart of the fraud, and the jury wouldn't have any difficulty distinguishing, you know, 400 plus thousand dollars from 130. I do think that um, that there are defenses here. Certainly, Michael Cohen's credibility is a defense, uh, and then the primary defense, of course. Uh, while it doesn't eliminate all the charges, uh, addresses the more serious charges, the actual felony charges, uh, which require, you know, Trump's intent to avoid uh, a felony beyond the uh, falsification of records. The falsification of records issue is merely a misdemeanor. And if that's all he's convicted on, he's not facing any jeopardy at all. Ty Cobb, I want to ask you about what's happening today in Washington as well. We've got the trial underway in New York, but the Supreme Court hearing arguments uh, on an appeal by one of the January 6th defendants, and this has to do with a law that goes back to the Enron case in 2002, aimed at people who obstruct an official proceeding. There are different ways, of course, to interpret that and whether it even applies to January 6th. Justice Neil Gorsuch challenged the government's lawyers' arguments in defense of that law, used to convict some of the defendants. Here's what he said. We'll have you respond. Would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? Where is this going, Ty, and how will it impact potentially the future of Jack Smith's case against Trump? So I think um, the argument today suggests that uh, the Supreme Court may narrow the approach taken by the government. Uh, I do think um, the Solicitor General, who's very talented and uh, I've had the privilege of working with in the past, um, you know, missed a slight opportunity there because I think she made a concession in response to uh, Justice Gorsuch's question when the, the right answer is yes. Uh, all those things could qualify. On the other hand, uh, it's unlikely that the government would bring those cases, and it's certainly uh, that none of them would result in 20 years in prison. So, you know, hypotheticals, as we know from um, the Trump immunity argument, where yeah. Trump's lawyer was asked about whether, you know, Trump could still see, send SEAL Team Six to assassinate a political rival. Hypotheticals sometimes get so far out of bounds uh, that they're not really realistic or helpful in the analysis of the actual statute. But I do think this statute poses some difficulties for both sides. Um, clearly, Congress wanted to uh, criminalize more than the mere uh, destruction of documents. But uh, the way they did it um, was not really consistent with many of the statutes of, uh, uh, you know, construction, statutory construction. And uh, it poses some, you know, unfortunately, uh, difficulties that only lawyers could quibble about. 
Um, the the, uh, the difficulty here, I think, is there is a overriding canon of statutory construction that criminal statutes have to be very, very narrowly construed. And uh, I think that's the primary obstacle for most of the conservative judges, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in this case, because a narrow construction would eliminate many of the um, uh, uses that the government has attempted with this statute in the January 6th uh, and, uh, proceedings. And Ty, just to be clear, do you think that it would do so have a direct ramifications for Jack Smith's case and the, the four charges against Trump in that case, or, or does it not have real bearing on that? That's the, that's the real important question here, Kaylee. And I think the, the uh, likelihood is it would not have a significant impact on Jack Smith's case. Because keep in mind in Jack Smith's case, there are fraudulent documents at the heart of the charge and those being the false elector certificates. So um, it could have some minimal impact in terms of evidentiary exclusions, but I don't believe that it's going to have the substantive impact that uh, people fear. All right. Former White House counsel Ty Cobb, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on Balance of Power. And coming up, we'll turn next to Capitol Hill. Republican Congressman French Hill of Arkansas will be with us as we discuss the options for aid to Ukraine in the House and the potential ramifications for the House Speaker. This is Bloomberg TV. And radio. I think it's a very intriguing proposal. We should be thinking about anything we possibly can to come to the support of Ukraine. This is an absolutely existential battle. Uh, not just for Ukraine itself, but um, for a global order. I think this is a proposal we should look at very carefully. That was UK Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt speaking with me earlier today on Bloomberg TV and radio about one of the options being discussed for how to pay for aid to Ukraine the seizure of frozen Russian assets. It's an effort that House Speaker Mike Johnson is pushing as part of a package of bills this week that would need to pass the Senate if it makes it through his chamber. And at least one senator doesn't seem in favor. Here is Republican Senator J.D. Vance earlier today on X, formerly known as Twitter. I think it's extremely important that we defeat the Repo Act or at the very least make it sunset in January of 2025. We're taking away a very important tool from our next president to be able to bring peace and advocate for American interests. We got to kill this law. The Repo Act is bad news. Let's go now to Capitol Hill, where Congressman French Hill, the Republican from Arkansas, is joining us. Congressman, always great to have you here on Balance of Power. Do those concerns that Senator J.D. Vance was voicing there have merit? Could potentially a dangerous precedent be set if these frozen Russian assets are indeed used to fund Ukraine's war effort? I don't believe so, Kaylee. It's good to be with you and Joe. I think the argument made uh, by Senator Vance is not a good one. We're not tying the president's hands. We're giving the president flexibility in using Russian uh, sovereign assets uh, that have already been frozen. We're going to put those in an account, and that account can be used for the benefit of Ukraine, working with Ukraine and other financial partners uh, in Europe. This is a, a more flexibility for the president, not limited. And I don't believe it ties anyone's hands. And I was pleased to see Jeremy Hunt supported uh, on behalf of the United Kingdom. And today, just today in Europe, uh, the Council of Europe voted to support the idea of seizing Russian sovereign assets, putting them in a, in a fund for the benefit of uh, Ukraine. So where's this going here, Congressman? We're all waiting, as you are, of course, for text uh, as early as this evening. We understand from those who are going to be writing these spending bills uh, that will include Ukraine. Will the Repo Act be attached to that, or does that come after when all the body parts are stitched back together into some sort of Frankenstein? Well, we need to uh, see what Speaker Johnson's final decision about, uh, about the legislative uh, text, as you say, and also the legislative process on the House floor. He's voiced support for repo because I think it's in the interest of American taxpayers and French taxpayers and German taxpayers to use frozen assets uh, by the perpetrator, uh, the Russians, some $300 billion available in Europe and the United States for the benefit of Ukraine. We've done this before. We did it when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, pursuant to a United Nations Security Council resolution, and we did it in the aftermath of uh, 
the Iranian hostage crisis in Iran back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. So there's precedent, there's international uh, leadership on this. So I believe that repo will be included, and we hope to see that in the text. But as to where in the text, Joe, we have to wait and see what Speaker Johnson's final decision is. Yeah, and we'll have to see if that text can indeed come out today and then allowing the 72-hour period to read it, if you will be able to vote on this by the end of the week. There also is the question, Congressman, of the consequence if this is put on the floor for a vote, if that will trigger the mar motion to vacate that Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course, is the one who initially moved on that. But Thomas Massey, your other Republican colleague, suggested today that he will endorse that effort and join her. How concerned are you now today relative to before Thomas Massey said that about the prospect of once again seeing the Speaker of the House vacated? I just don't think it's in the interest of the Republican Party or the 2024 campaign season or in President Trump's presidential election aspirations for the House Republicans to throw another speaker out of office. That makes no political or a good judgment to me. Mike Johnson inherited some critical issues because eight Republicans teamed up with Democrats to toss Kevin McCarthy out of office last October. Those were fiscal 24 spending, the foreign intelligence surveillance reauthorization and reform, and now the uh, defense supplemental for Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine. Mike Johnson is doing a very good job with the hand that he's been dealt. And I don't believe that that justifies him being thrown out of office again. I think that would hurt the Republican cause in 2024, hurt President Trump's presidential campaign, and do nothing to advance the Republican mission here on Capitol Hill. Congressman Hill, we saw articles of impeachment go from the House today to the Senate uh, for the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. And this happens at the same time that President Biden uh, refuses to accept Congressman Jim Comer's invitation to testify in what appears to be his own impeachment proceeding here. We heard from the White House, the special counsel uh, to President Biden wrote a letter back to Jim Comer saying your impeachment investigation is over. Is he right? You know, I don't believe so. I think uh, the Ways and Means Committee, the Oversight Committee, uh, headed by Jamie Comer, and Judiciary Committee, headed by Jim Jordan, are still following the leads that they developed in the investigation of Hunter Biden's laptop and the whistleblowers, the IRS uh, whistleblowers. They're trying to get to the bottom of that. And actually, uh, President Biden should be grateful that the House called and asked his opinion for testimony and provide documents, because I'm not so sure the Democrats uh, provided any such uh, discretion to President Trump and their two mm. impeachments there. So due process is important. Even though there's no due process yeah. right, per se, it's still important yeah. to see that done, I think. Well, it's good to see you again, Congressman. French Hill of Arkansas, we thank you for joining us, as always, on Bloomberg. I'm Joe Matthew. This is Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio. The two biggest shocks that we've seen in the last few years, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the attack on Israel, have both been met by a very united response from Western allies, much more united than our opponents were expecting. And I think that what that demonstrates is that when the chips are down, we recognize the seriousness of the situation. We work together with our friends and allies. That was Jeremy Hunt, UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, talking with Kaylee earlier today on Bloomberg. Joining us now, James Jeffrey, Wilson Center Chair of the Middle East Program, former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq and Turkey. Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to Bloomberg. It's great to have you with us as we consider the idea of this alliance, even though it may be a relatively small one. Israel is reportedly considering a response here to Iran that would include uh, sending a message but not causing casualties. Is it possible for Israel to conduct a military response that will not cause problems with the U.S., the U.K., France, and others? Uh, thank you, Joe, for having me on. Uh, it is possible, but in the end, the Israelis have to decide this because this is their security. They're in an existential struggle in which the Hamas October 7th attack and the latest Iranian attack two days ago are only the manifestations of the tip of the iceberg that has been Iran's march through the region for the last 20 years. 
Israel is just one of the many targets. This is why Israel and the United States were able to mobilize European countries and Arab countries to help fend off the Iranian attack. What Israel wants to do now is to reestablish deterrence. Mm. That's a principle of Israeli foreign policy, and it's understandable. But remember, when Saddam Hussein fired 40 mis uh, missiles into uh, Israel in 1991, Israel didn't respond. Rather, it stayed out of the fight and allowed the United States to take down mm. Saddam's armies in Kuwait a few weeks later. President Trump did not respond after we killed Qasem Soleimani, the uh, Iranian Quds Force leader, in 2020, uh, and we were attacked by some 20 or 30 missiles. Again, sometimes the best approach is to find other ways to bring down your enemy more subtly. Well, Ambassador, I wonder if you view what would be beneficial to Israel in the near term and long term as being the same in this instance, because there's been the prospect raised of, for example, Israel striking directly uh, Iranian nuclear facilities, potentially taking out some capacity, which would have a longer term ramification. But of course, in the near term, that also could just spark potentially the regional conflict that everyone is so worried about. How carefully does Israel need to tread here, even if potentially it leaves lingering threats that they will have to face in the future? Right. First of all, uh, without using nuclear weapons, people think Israel has, <clears throat> but no confirmation. Israel can't take out Iran. Uh, in, in particular, it can't take out the Iranian nuclear capacity, particularly the Fodro uh, enrichment facility, which is buried under a mountain near Qum, Iran. Only the U.S. has that capability. <clears throat> and the U.S. has warned Israel that it will not go along with a uh, retaliatory strike. Uh, the U.S. fears a uh, widening of this war, uh, tens of thousands, not hundreds, of missiles flying in each direction, and possible American casualties. The better approach for Israel, frankly, is to press the United States in return for not launching a retaliatory raid, <clears throat> for the United States to be pressed to give Israel the final green light to finish off Hamas in Gaza, in the town of Rafah along the Egyptian border. That is a critical need for Israel, and it would be a far bigger blow to Iran and its alliance than anything Israel could do in the air, particularly something that doesn't uh, create casualties, which, believe me, is very hard. Mm. Ambassador, I need to ask you about what's happening or not happening in the case of Ukraine. With a concerted debate here, we're waiting for a legislative text on a bill that would potentially send funding for Ukraine now months in the making. The administration here in Washington told us at the end of last year that the window was closing uh, for Ukraine. We know that they are running low on ammo. At what point is it just too little too late? If they pass this bill tonight, and that won't happen, by the way, uh, it still takes an enormous amount of time to direct the money to start making the shells that Ukraine needs. Where are they going to be in June, if, for instance, if it takes that long? Is it already too late? Uh, no, it is not too late. First of all, uh, despite the fact that, as people say, uh, the, uh, the tactical situation on the ground in Ukraine has shifted from uh, Ukraine being on the offensive not very successfully last year to Russia seizing some territory in the past four months. But the territory it seized is about the size of Washington, D.C. Uh, it's not a large area. Uh, the Russians have their own problems. And if the Ukrainians go back on the defensive, what you need is not just artillery pieces and artillery shells and money from the United States, but a lot of concrete and a lot of shovels to dig deep. Uh, minefields to plant, other obstacles to put in the way. It's very hard to crush a determined uh, force that is dug in, as Israel, for example, is seeing in Gaza. Uh, it can be done, but not easily. Meanwhile, Ukraine can buy time that way. Uh, I'm sure that in the end, the U.S. and other uh, countries in NATO, European countries, can come up with the money. My goodness, we have between us some uh, 30 times the GDP, the uh, economic uh, wealth of Russia. Uh, why can't we provide support to an ally that is uh, faithfully and heroically defending itself and uh, tying down most of the Russian military? This is a great uh, benefit for all of us and for our security and for our peace at home. Well, and Ambassador, as you talk about 
the idea that we're seeing maybe something Israel, uh, Israel fighting a Duggan enemy or combatants at the same time that you're seeing kind of the Duggan nature reflected in Ukraine. I also wonder what parallels you see or the relationship of these two conflicts, knowing that Iran specifically does have a relationship with Russia. How does what happens in Ukraine also affect what happens in the Middle East or vice versa? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll have to go back to my personal uh, uh, intellectual and foreign policy hero, Henry Kissinger. Uh, in looking at uh, the globe and looking at international relations, you have to distinguish between a normal situation and an abnormal one. An abnormal one is created when a regional or global power tries to overthrow the system, a revolutionary power in that sense. Napoleon was one, Hitler was another, Stalin was the third. The whole Cold War was all about this. Right now, we have two powers that are absolutely directly trying to overthrow regional orders, Russia in Europe and Iran in the Middle East, and it's no surprise that they're supporting each other. China, uh, the jury is still out. Uh, <clears throat> I and others talked to the Chinese. Uh, they certainly do not want an overall confrontation with the United States. They're reluctant to use military force in any direct way, uh, but we have to watch that closely. But so far, certainly between Iran and Russia, we have a challenge to the global order. And uh, what we learned in the 1930s, tragically, is if you do not respond to it in faraway places, uh, it comes to you. All right, Ambassador, we appreciate your insight and bringing your experience to us. That is Ambassador James Jeffrey Wilson, Center Chair of the Middle East Program and former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq and Turkey. Now coming up still, we'll turn back to domestic affairs as President Biden is in Pennsylvania campaigning while Donald Trump is still sitting in a courtroom here in New York. We'll be joined by our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is a balance of power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Kaylee Lyons in New York alongside Joe Matthew in Washington. But we go now to New Mexico because the southernmost district there might help decide which party will control the U.S. House in November. The congressional district has a reputation for frequent political turnovers and even earned the nickname of the swingiest of swing districts. Joining us now is Billy House, Bloomberg congressional reporter who just returned from a trip there. Billy, it's a great story. You can read it on the terminal or online. But what exactly do we need to know about this district and what issue specifically is most resonating there? Well, it's a it's a huge district. It's along the 100. It extends along the entire 180 mile Mexican border of New Mexico, southern New Mexico, and it's 55 percent uh, Hispanic enrollment, uh, voter enrollment. So that makes it unique in many ways. And uh, along with some of the quirky things, such as this is where the Trinity site, the nuclear bomb uh, of the thing uh, explosion occurred. Uh, there's places like named Truth of Consequences. Hatch Chili is there. And uh, just all kinds of weird rodeos and festivals that make it a very unique area. I've been fortunate to have visited Truth of Consequences. Yeah. Um, that 55 percent of the voting bloc, mm -hmm. uh, Hispanic voters, look at the border in what way? Because I know that this can cut both ways when it comes to Latino voters whether it's sympathizing with Joe Biden's perspective on this, the humane treatment of migrants, right. or closing the border, getting to this, you know, who's next in line sort of uh, attitude. What did you hear when you were there? You make a very good point. But one thing to remember, especially in New Mexico, is that the Hispanic voter, quote unquote, is not a monolithic block. That's right. And New Mexico, a different from perhaps its mayor, neighbors, uh, Texas and Arizona, seems to have a more muted uh, feeling more of generation, multi-generational acceptance of immigrants, so go, dating back to their historic and ancient history as a Spanish. But uh, what we saw there, what I saw there, was more of an acceptance, more of a sort of compassionate uh, uh, approach yeah. to the immigration thing. And business-related, they have some border areas they want to develop economically, and they see border relations as a key to that. Well, yeah, it's interesting, Billy and Kaylee, when we hear from uh, lawmakers talking about every state being a border state. Your headline says it all. The border crisis is personal. 
in this battleground district. We thank Bloomberg's Billy House, a great story that we point you to, as Kaylee mentioned, on the terminal and online. Another state that will be in focus, of course, in November is Pennsylvania. And President Biden's campaigning there today as Donald Trump is in a New York City courtroom. Joining us now for more on this, our political panel to get into the campaign. Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies, is here along with Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions. Kristen, this is kind of a moment the Biden campaign has been gearing up for. And now we know for a fact Donald Trump's going to be stuck in court four days a week while Joe Biden gallivants around swing districts. Trump made the point himself today he could be in a lot of states doing work for his campaign right now, but he's scowling at a camera in New York. How did Joe Biden do in framing that contrast today? I think that they've, they've done a good job over the last several weeks in framing this. They knew it was going to happen. We've been talking about it for months and months, and it's finally happening. And you can see that Donald Trump is going before the cameras each and every day, trying to frame this. Um, you know, he's been persecuted, um, and he's been somewhat successful uh, in that endeavor. But I think the president's finally out there on the campaign trail going to these tough states for us to win, yeah. um, really kind of like uh, highlighting that contrast. Well, we do know now, Kristen and Mora, that the proceedings have wrapped up today. So day two is over. They will uh, reassemble on Thursday morning because the court is taking Wednesdays off in this trial. But now that he has to vacate the courtroom more, it's possible we will hear from him again later on today. I wonder if you think this strategy is still going to be effective. Certainly during the primary campaign, to the extent that there was one, this was something that galvanized the base. It did work for him to use courthouse appearances as campaign stops. He was fundraising off of it. We're in the general election now for all intents and purposes. Does the playbook need to change on that front? I think it needs to adjust. I mean, you're still going to see those campaign emails, those fundraising emails coming out and saying, I'm, you know, being persecuted. I, you know, this is a witch hunt. This is an unfair trial, all these things. But his inability to control himself and to control his impulses to lash out, to speak out, uh, to violate the gag order time and time again, it's going to wear on people. And it already sort of is. And, you know, I don't know how much it'll move the needle for, for his loyalists. They're going to be loyalists no matter what. They'll probably tune out most of this and just stick with their plan to vote for Trump. But for those that are going to really make or break this election, this kind of behavior and not taking it seriously and not actually trying to rise above some of this, you know, childish behavior uh, will wear on them. Uh, it'll wear on them. And uh, I just wonder to what extent people will start paying attention for it to wear on them, though, Kristen. Is it, is it Labor Day? To, what's what's the, the, the time horizon that Joe Biden has to make this case for people who are not paying attention? I mean, I think it's a long way till Election Day still. You know, I mean, you and I are sitting here and we pay attention to it every single right. day. But I think that people get tired of this and not everybody's sitting in front of cable news watching this. So we could have a verdict every, by the time it matters. It, exactly. Exactly. So I think that the, the timing on this um, is up in the air. It's up to uh, the president and his campaign team to remind people. And this is just the first of many, um, you know, court appearances. So, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see how this actually impacts the vote, you know, closer to November. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, this is more a kind of the one of the ways in which Biden is trying to contrast himself with Trump in terms of the legal issues, in terms of threats to democracy. But we were just hearing from uh, Billy there on this swing district in New Mexico. It's districts like this where perhaps more minds are not uh, made up or more subject to change. And what they're talking about is the border. Mm. How should messaging focus on issues at a time when also there is a very easy contrast you could paint by saying, okay, look who's in a courtroom and who's not. Right, and I think that's what th some of the problems are here too, is that this is all focused on Trump. Trump is focused on himself. He's talking about his witch, this witch hunt against him. He is personally being attacked. He's not talking about why he's running in the first place, why he wants to be president, what he's gonna do for the people that he purports to, to be defending and to be mm -hmm. running for. And I think that's really where you're gonna need to see the candidates themselves talk about forward-looking uh, issues that matter to the voters and not on past disgruntles and, and, and frustrations they have, you know, uh, uh, personal ones, personal vendettas. I think people are exhausted by it and they want to hear, what are you going to do for me? That's what people are going to draw people to the, to the booths, you know, in November. Well, Maura and Kristen will be sticking with us. As I said, court is now adjourned. We did hear from Donald Trump. He's saying that the judge is highly conflicted and that this is a witch hunt. 
a lot of accusations that he has made before around this case and others will continue to keep you apprised uh, should Donald Trump say anything more coming up another Republican is supporting efforts to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson we'll have all the details with this political panel next on Balanced Power on Bloomberg TV and radio I won't give Speaker Johnson advice. I mean, I support, obviously, aid to Israel. I think we need to aid Ukraine. Obviously, we need to support Taiwan. How they want to process those as a procedural matter is really a question for Speaker Johnson and House Republicans. I don't know what it takes to uh, achieve Speaker Johnson's goals. My goals are to get the package that passed with a strong bipartisan vote in the Senate passed uh, by the House of Representatives as quickly as possible. Delaying this is not just a political chore but it is also jeopardizing Ukraine's chance for survival. If we get Ukraine funding done, if we get Israel funding done, then I, and Indo-Pacific, Indo I, I don't care how the sausage is made. We just need something that needs to go to the president's desk. That was Senators Tom Cotton, Dick Durbin, and Tom Tillis on Capitol Hill earlier today. And back with us now, our political panel, Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies, and Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions. So, Kristen, essentially what you heard from the senators there is they might have to just take what they can get from the House in whatever form it comes. It seems that what Mike Johnson has settled on is splitting aid for Ukraine, aid for Israel, aid for the Indo-Pacific, and another package that will include repo and other things all up. We think we haven't seen the text yet. Would it behoove Democrats rather in the House or the Senate to just go along with whatever ultimately is able to get on the floor and pass it, considering they have been asking for this aid to pass for quite a long time. Well, I mean, I think it's not um, it's not a new strategy to split these bills up so the members don't have to vote for everything that they don't want to vote for. And then you cobble them together and send them over to the Senate in 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 what would look a lot uh, like what the Senate actually passed, uh, which Senator Durbin was discussing by a large bipartisan vote. So I think if, if anything's going to get done. Speaker Johnson is going to have to work with the Democrats. He's going to have to put together uh, a coalition of votes that are Republicans who want to who want to get something done, Democrats who want to get something done, and and maybe depart from from the fringes of both sides. Maura, you worked for Speaker John Boehner, and you understand parliamentary procedure here. Uh, if you're Mike Johnson and you don't have the votes to get all of these done right now, and again, we don't have legislative text to be talking about here, but there's a very good chance he's going to have to work around the Rules Committee. He hasn't been able to get a rule on the floor that has worked for some time. I think seven have failed. So in that world, we suspend the rules and require Democrats to vote for apparently each of these things. Is it possible for him to pull this off and look smart by breaking them up? Or is this a fool's errand? One of them ends up failing, if not all of them, and we're back to square one. I think that his attempt to give his members cover uh, was strategic and also to help get these aid bills across the floor in a way that he thinks is only possible. Yes, will it require Democrats to vote with him and with the majority of the Republican Party passing these bills? Absolutely. Uh, but that's going to be a given on any bill at this point because he has such a slim majority and is getting slimmer by the day. So mm -hmm. it, it will be incredibly important for really all members to to do a gut check and decide do I want to play politics today or do I want to get this passed and actually provide aid to our allies around the world. Well more Democrats might also be needed to help save the speaker's gavel if this motion to vacate actually moves if you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene and Tom Massey going to vote to oust the speaker and Mike Gallagher retires at the end of the week you're going to need at least one Democrat that's just how the math works do you see the math mathing in favor of Johnson or against him if this all actually comes to fruition I think if you have Democrats like a Tom Swasey and others who have said that they would and Moskowitz I believe he has also said that they would uh, vote to to table the motion to vacate the chair uh, and that's what the, that Johnson would need that he would need probably a couple others too because you then have Thomas Massey telling everyone that he's got a whole roster of people who are going to more than McCarthy that's going to stand behind him so I think he's going to need Democrats to, to again do a sort of check okay what do I want to get across do I want to get aid done do I want to actually see this legislative body produce something uh, or continue to play politics continue to play uh, games with 
with really our security too. I mean, helping our allies is for our benefit as well here in the United States. And so making that case to constituents is going to be super important, both for Johnson, but also for the Democrats who do decide to hopefully motion, uh, table the motion. I still think it's fascinating. The language we're hearing, Kaylee, from Marjorie Taylor Greene today, she says she's being careful. He's definitely not going to be speaker next Congress if we're lucky enough to have the majority. That does not sound like somebody who's about to make this a privileged resolution. We'll find out in the next couple of days. Kristen Hahn, Maura Gillespie, great to see both of you. Great panel and a smart talk with us. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter to follow up on all the stories we covered today on the program. You can find it on the terminal and online. All right, I got a train to catch. I'm heading back to Washington. Joe, I'll see you back there tomorrow. And of course, you can find us both back here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.